Hello and welcome everyone to the next Four Minute Deep Dive. Not your host, Ken Gilvin, here as always. And today I am delighted to have the main man himself, the original author, Ohad. It's good to have you on the show today. Um, and with him, we've got Gail as well. And today we're going to be looking at uh, UI elements in Foreman. We're going to be looking at the new React stack that's been added. We're going to talk a bit about uh, where we might want to go with the UI, um, all that kind of stuff. So, Ohad, Gail, welcome. Hey. Thanks, Greg. That's a really nice introduction. Um, hey, guys. I'm really happy to be here on, I don't know, it's not on stage, but really happy to be here. Um, it's been a while, so it's great. It's, it's great fun. It has. It um, has. So I'm going to show a little bit. So I'm currently just, just before you get started, just let me remind everyone: um, if you have any questions while we're, we're we're running through the show, if you want to join in live, there's IRC hash the foreman. Fire your questions in there, and I will pick them up. Or you can use the YouTube live chat, and I will look at that, and I will try and keep an eye on Twitter as well, although that's not the best medium for questions. Um, but all of these I will watch, and in the meantime, Ohad, it's all yours. All right. Thank you. All right. So. Um, I'm currently broadcasting you from Red Hat office in Israel. Uh, very happy to be here. Um, the plan for today uh, is open. That means, as Greg said, you, you guys can help shape the discussion. Uh, so hopefully it's a two-way kind of discussion. Um, what I want to talk about today is about work that has been done in the last few months in Foreman Core. Uh, in preparation, uh, or the main goal would be to improve the usability of Foreman. Um, Foreman and its plugin ecosystem. And what I want to do, do today a little bit is to uh, explain the journey we, we went through in the last uh, few months uh, until where we are today. And hopefully, this will be enough for you guys to get involved, have an opinion, or idea, ideally patches. Uh, so with that, obviously, uh, uh, just to mention a few of the names that have been involved, you know, we have Gail that drove a lot of this, wrote most of the code and drove a lot of the discussions. Uh, Tomer, Eric, Walden, Tomas, and others. So credit to all of you guys being involved and, and you know, moving things forward and really well. So start with that. Thank you, guys. Um, and with that, uh, a little bit about uh, why we, we, we're actually working on this for those who are interested in the background. Uh, basically, Foreman UI has been very Rails-centric. Uh, that means we use traditional Rails, uh, Ruby on Rails uh, way of doing UI. And it's been great. It's been, it served us well. It was stable and you know, mature to most cases. But all of those areas that needed some extra work, uh, things that fall, fell out of the you know, common, known, safe areas of Rails were always kind of challenging. Uh, we had, um, you know, all kind of, we well, basically used jQuery in the past, like, you know, seven years old project. Uh, so that jQuery was the only option back in the days. And we, we were never really happy with the idea of rewriting our UI or, or doing any major drastic changes. So we were looking for ways that can integrate, integrate what we currently have, uh, but open, a, open the door for, for basically new, new options uh, when it comes to writing more um, non trivial UI. And our experience in the last few years when we did any UI related features, whether it was uh, the, the class parameters, you know, has a lot of logic, whether it was the networking UI, maybe, maybe it was even in plugins like the remote execution. Um, all of these UIs were, let's say, non standard of showing you guys a list and some actions on the list and then some data but more interactive where you have to click on things and move from one state to another and, you know, more complicated logic. Uh, it was really painful, I think. Uh, I think most developers will also agree that it's painful to write it and painful to maintain it. And at the end, you don't get an amazing result. It's just it's good enough, but it's not great. Um, so really, all of this uh, experience taught us that we probably need to expand uh, from the traditional Rails ERB uh, not for everything, obviously, but for some things that, that require it. And also, the, the jQuery rate, way of writing code uh, tried to move away to something which is a bit more manageable. So with that, uh, we started 
yeah, discussing, you probably all know the RFC repository, or hopefully you, you guys know by now we have something called RFCs, requests for comments, where people suggest ideas. And, and that's basically the way to introduce new uh, concepts to Foreman and its ecosystem. So we started with how we handle uh, JavaScript assets. We moved to a more modern uh, package management system for, for JavaScript, uh, NPM, and Webpack. Um, and with it, and, and now what I'm going to focus a little bit, uh, but I'm more than happy to accept any questions for around any of this, obviously. Uh, so you'll see a bit of Webpack and NPM in the background. If you haven't seen it before, probably we, we can help. But uh, I'll try to focus a little bit on React. So first of all, uh, I'm not going to. I'm not a React developer per se. That means I might get a few things wrong. Uh, I have an experience with React. I played with it. I worked with it. I wrote some code. But I'm not not an expert in any way. Um, I I think um, we're we're doing our best learning it. Uh, it's a new thing, and and there is, as like anything that is new and um, sophisticated, it also comes with some complexity. Uh, so there's best practice and things like that that we might not be aware of, and we're constantly learning. But regardless, I'll try to give you the an idea of what React is, how it works. Um, and what is how it's implemented in Foreman. So, um, unless there's any question at this point, I'm going to start with something visual just to, to start with. Uh, I'm going to share uh, my browser, and I'm going to show you the first feature that was merged in 1.14. Uh, I hope you can see it well. It's actually a little bit zoomed in, so it's a bit smaller than usual. But basically, I'm going to show you uh, the charts, um, that with the statistics charts that we have replaced in, in 1.14. Um, the idea of why charts is simply because we wanted to find a place in the application that A, visible, you know, noticeable in terms of UI, but B, does not interfere with any other work we've been doing. Uh, the charts have been here forever, and they got very little attention over the years. Um, but in our initial implementation, we were more focused on implementing the technology uh, rather than, you know, redesigning the page. So it's actually uh, trying to keep the same look and feel, a bit more more modern in terms of the libraries we use behind the scene and maybe the responsiveness, but uh, more or less uh, similar to what you had before. So uh, don't expect any amazing wow effects when you're looking at the statistics page, but I'm trying to, um, what I'll do, I'll try to break it down a little bit, uh, and then later on uh, we'll go into code, uh, where the code is located and testing and so on. So, but just to start with something visual, um, this is the statistics page. On the monitor, we have statistics page. Basically, it's a sets sets of uh, charts, all they call donor chart. Um, you, I think you all know what the charts are. But basically, when you hover, you have like a breakdown, percentage, name, title, colors, and so on. Uh, you also have the ability to click on something and you get a modal. Uh, same chart, just bigger. And if you click on any of those uh, links here, uh, you'll effectively get uh, into search. So you'll, it will uh, drive a search from here to uh, basically, in this case, it's the eight rel servers that I have uh, somewhere. So um, basically, the charts are uh, not the most uh, uh, sophisticated uh, component of UI, but uh, just to show a little bit, when I refresh the page, you can see there is some loader, basically, and uh, eventually the data comes in. So nothing uh, fancy, thinner, uh, and so on. But uh, just keep it in mind later on when I when I uh, jump into the code. Um, all right. So with that, um, I w what I want to do, I want to before I'm going to jump into uh, the statistics code. I want to introduce React a little bit with React patterns. And I'm going to show you something which is not 100% trivial, but on the other hand, uh, some example of something that I wrote is not related to uh, Foreman. And show it uh, so you guys can know how to read uh, JavaScript. Hopefully, you guys already saw JavaScript code before. Uh, if not, something's going to look a bit weird, but hopefully you'll, you'll get the point. Um, what I want to show you, uh, I want to show you a couple of things. First of all, something very simple. Um, hopefully, you guys know uh, Patternfly. Patternfly is the library that we use um, for style. 
Uh, we follow their guidelines and standards and designs as much as we can. And we are always, there's lots of work, uh, work on this area. So there's plenty of new things we can introduce from Patternfly. Uh, and you can see here, for example, examples for, I don't know, alerts or all kind of reference uh, UI um, that you guys can uh, you know, later on see how it's implemented, how to implement it and, and so on. Uh, what I want to show you, first of all, uh, where did my, yeah, not my down, sorry, the notification. Sorry, hold on. As usual, we have live demos. Uh, I think it's here. But basically, what I want to show you, uh, is it this one now? Hold on. Okay. Bear with me for a second. Uh, no. Anyway, I'll find the link later on, but I'll just show you the UI. So uh, basically, we have um, some, it's currently in a PR, but another piece of infrastructure uh, to help to visualize things. There's a PR called, uh, a tool called Storybook. Uh, the idea is that you can sh show uh, just a partial representation of the UI you're working on. In React, they're called components. That means components is something that you know, contain some uh, some UI elements potentially and some maybe non-UI elements, but basically it's broken down into components. And so I'm gonna show you a, a bunch of components uh, so it's easy to visualize them. And what I wanna show you is those these toast notifications. So for example, the success state, the error state, uh, success with link, with, so you can click on something here or a warning. Okay, these are the designs made out of Paddenfly and the um, implementation in this case is done in React. Um, so these are very simple in terms of, uh, you know, how they're written behind the scene. I, I guess you all know how to open uh, your browser and look, they're called Toast Notification and they have whatever. You know, just... I uh, don't know whether you were speaking there or have, but you're breaking up quite a bit at the moment. So. Yeah, it, it looks like the CPU on my machine went up when uh, I, right, I, right. I zoomed in. But anyway, the, the, if you look at the later on, 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 the, on the HTML representation here, basically there's a button for the clear and there's some div structure and eventually you have uh, the, the icon and and so on and so forth. So it's nothing, nothing too uh, complicated in, in HTML. So I'm going to show that it's basically something that has very little interaction in the UI. Uh, so let me uh, switch over to my editor. Um, so I can show you a little bit of code. Okay. Again, I'll trace the font a little bit. And Okay. Can you see it? Is it reasonable size? That's that should be okay, I think. Yeah. Okay. So um, this is uh, the implementation of the, the toast notification, about 30 lines of code. Um, what we have here, we have uh, uh, imports, basically. I'm not going to go line by line, but basically just import is the way to include React in our namespace, and there's a library called React Bootstrap. Uh, then I'm going to use the button component from that library. And I have some uh, constant here to do mapping between um, states in CSS classes. In this case, success is called OK and danger and so on, uh, and provide some info. Uh, this component is something that is a stateless component. That means uh, it doesn't really have state. Uh, it doesn't really have any logic. It's mostly displaying stuff based on arguments. So, for example, the type of uh, warning or whether it's warning or not uh, here, uh, will be dictated as a property, whatever, uh, that is being passed. So, in this case, uh, I either pass a property or I do not pass a property, and then it gets uh, defaults into the, uh, the success type. So before I jump into the implementation, I want to show you how it's going, how it's actually being used. Um, so in our uh, storybook, I basically defined the stories, and here I I just uh, added the stories we saw earlier with the 
uh, success state. And basically, this is the syntax. It's kind of weird syntax for JavaScript. It's closer to HTML or even XML in some way. But basically, uh, this is how I define toast is the name of the component and title equal great success is the uh, the argument that I pass to this component and obviously you can see that uh, an error one an example for an error component will be I just added another uh, attribute of type and in this case I call it danger uh, which maps to the to the uh, um, constants that I have here okay and you, it, we can extend it further, you know, toast with uh, link, so you, you can pass another argument and, and so on, and, and just another example for warning. So this is a nice uh, side effect of uh, manual testing with Storybook, is just you can basically define the, the kind of scenarios you want to present, and then you can go one, or basically different states of your component, and then you can def just visualize it and, and even share it. So when you guys are developing PRs and you want to have some feedback, uh, that's a great way you know, to define how it looks and then pass it down to someone else to have a look on it and give you feedback. Okay, so coming back to the component itself, in here we have some logic, uh, not too expensive, you know, nothing too exciting, but basically something that defines the icon based on the, the name of the, uh, the type basically so we either take the default one or the type that was specified within it. and eventually somewhere this is actually HD, kind of HTML uh, you could actually mix in both HTML and potentially um, uh, nested components so in here you can see a div which is similar to HTML and we also have a button which is um, another component which um, again gets other arguments and you can use it, uh, basically, you can nest components uh, quite, you know, it, it's quite often that you actually, you never create one component by itself, but it's common practice or best practice to break down components to do one, one thing and one thing only, or, you know, one set, very sets, small sets of things that the component owns, and then it's uh, much easier to manage it and reuse. Okay, so basically you can see here uh, examples for, uh, you know, how do I uh, use the properties? Uh, if there's a link, I can just put in a link. If there is an icon, I'll just put the icon. And if there's a title, I'll just put the title in strong. So again, this is just like a templating language. In this example, it's much closer to a templating language to uh, JavaScript um, versus uh, anything else. So one thing that we never had before in Foreman and, and th that gave us quite a bit of pain was the lack of ability to create HTML from JavaScript. So if you think about places in the app like parameters, when you add and remove a parameter, this is done in JavaScript, right? You don't go to the server to get back the HTML representation for the new field of, of the new parameter, or the same goes for adding an interface, adding a VM storage or VM interface, all these kinds of things. Um, basically, this was... Uh, the server would, the way we implemented in the past was that the server created a template version of it and then in JavaScript we'll do all kind of said voodoo to replace uh, the IDs so they're unique and all kind of weird kind of flow, workarounds uh, just that we don't have to go to the server to get back because then it will be slow. Um, so just having this, just having this example is a good way just to create HTML from JavaScript by itself. Okay, now, uh, for those who are confused a little bit, uh, this is not JavaScript. Uh, it's something called JS6, um, and therefore, you know, the for, first of all, we're, we're, we're talking about ES6. Uh, well, uh, so, um, so just before you move on, we've had a, a question uh, from Marek, uh, wants to know uh, the difference in the capitalization. So why is your div uh, starts with lowercase d, and why is button a, a capital B? Okay, thank you. And I was actually answering that, uh, oh, but <laughs> no, no, no worries. Um, so, the, the, so what I'm saying it was so. First of all, this is ES6, so it gets pre-compiled into legacy JavaScript until all browser will support you know more modern types of JavaScript, uh, and this is done with Webpack. The um, the um, so what we see here is is again it's kind of a it's JavaScript that go, gets through compil compilation process. Um, and then 
because at the end of the day, the browser really knows how to handle HTML or how to handle JavaScript. Um, but what you can see here is a pattern where uh, the JavaScript now encapsulates the HTML, right? If you think about uh, traditionally what we had before in Rails, you had the HTML in ERB, so you'd have some sort of a templated HTML, and you could, in theory, include JavaScript in there, but it was not natural. Then with the evolution of tools like Angular 1, you would see that the HTML would encapsulate JavaScript or some sort of logic. The logic would exist in, in, in the HTML. And now it, it's the, actually the other way around where the JavaScript actually encapsulates the HTML. Now, to answer Mark's question, um, the return in this case is what the actual, the compiled output of this uh, um, logic, uh, function. And the div is a real div. You know, just gets passed back as a string, but the button is actually a React component. That's why it's, it's capitalized, um, where it tells basically uh, Webpack to go and try to, or Webpack and React to go basically to find a component called button, and then ask it to render or return its, you know, its HTML representation, and then it, you know, it eventually it will bubble up to. Uh, the top level components which will return the HTML you know, or JavaScript part. So in this case, div is just a div, the, the div that you know, and the capitalized button, button is, is just uh, a component. And, and that component in this case is, is defined in the React Bootstrap um, library. And I'm going to switch again to my browser. Sorry, I, we, we had some technical difficulties with, with um, with sharing my entire screen. Uh, I don't know why. Uh, so I'm going to uh, share again my browser uh, just to show you React uh, Bootstrap. Uh, again, kind of similar to the Bootstrap uh, official website, but this is like a native implementation of uh, React. Uh, sorry, a Bootstrap in React. And in here, you can see the component. Uh, examples and if I look at the code, basically what generate this is all it's a button and the button con uh, you know various uh, properties. Uh, you have uh, like any other examples in, in Bootstrap, there's, uh, there's an API reference here and all the parameters that you can pass. So again, it's a kind of a component that wraps buttons. So you can think about about it like conceptually similar to our Rails helpers. Uh, that, um, you know, kind of uh, have an API, you pass some parameters, like let's say the spinner helper, you, you pass some uh, attributes to it and you get back the HTML representation of a spinner. So in this case, uh, you, you have something conceptually similar, but with, uh, with, with the entire benefits of the JavaScript uh, part that you can add logic to it and actions and events and so on. Okay, uh, before I move on, any more questions? Uh, yes, please. Uh, this is Dimitri. Uh, how do conflicts, naming conflicts, get results? So, for example, you have a component that, or two components, and maybe we put different spelling or casing, or if there is a conflict between an HTML element and a component. Name. Okay. Uh, let me go back to my editor. So, first of all, in Webpack, um, since the uh, each each file or basically declare its dependencies at the top. You can see here that I imported React and imported the button. So in this case, button will always resolve to React Bootstrap. If there are multiple button implementation, that's completely Webpack's fault to handle uh, how they are isolated from one another. Uh, and maybe this, there are nuances that I'm not aware, of, but maybe Gail knows. But generally, this basically defines and. Uh, give you an I, I, kind of an isolation in terms of names, namespace, and, and so on. Um, also, in my um, index.js book, which is my storybook uh, definition, what we saw earlier, uh, I actually imported all of the all of the uh, things that I want to do. So in this case, I imported the toast a component and I specified a path. So in a minute, we'll go through um, so go through the file system layout. So maybe again, it will be a bit easier to. Uh, hopefully, that was your question. Can you have explicit namespaces? 
for the Olympics? Um, I guess the answer is yes. I don't know for certain. Gail, do you know the answer? I think you don't need them. Okay. Um, you know, in the, this ES6 situation, you're going to be, you know, the, the only way you're going to get a conflict is you import two different things from two different places, but give them the same name. Exactly. You shouldn't do that, but, but that's... So if I'll do something like that, import toast from here and import toast from uh, another file. And then you can see my editor immediately tell me it's already defined, and that won't pass any linting uh, mm -hmm. as well. So I, I, don't, I, I don't think that will be a common problem. Um, Thanks. Okay. Uh, now, not to confuse uh, React, Webpack, etc. They know by or Babel, they know by themselves now to distinguish between an HTML directive, which is a button, and the React component, which is a button. Button. And in this case, if I would uh, if I would put a small um, uh, a small uh, down case uh, button it will be translated as an HTML and I can just pass here. And you know what, in this case, it might even work. You know, there's, uh, I don't think I actually use any, any logic or any value, so I could just pass a button. But in, in other places, it might make sense to encapsulate the logic of the component somewhere separate from your app and just use it, you know, continuously use it like a collection of, um, you know, infrastructure that is defined once and used many times. Okay, um, any more questions before I move on? We've had a couple, but I think uh, they're probably more general discussion points for, for towards the end, so I've made a note and, uh, and we'll come back to those. Okay. Um, all right, the next thing I wanna show, another uh, React component just so we feel more comfortable. Uh, again, I'm switching for my browser, sorry. I'm gonna, I'm gonna probably keep apologizing for this for a while. Um, I'm gonna show you in Patternfly website, uh, the search widget. Um, basically under widgets we have search. Uh, that's an example reference for how to write a search component. Basically uh, search is, is just a, um, you know, just a, 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 an input where you usually have like a, a, a submit button or kind of an icon. Uh, so it's usually a form. And if you type something, you usually have something to clear. Okay, we're not talking about form and autocompleter. That's a different story. I'm just trying to go with simple components. So if I look at the reference uh, markup coming from Paddlefly, you could see that it's actually a form and the form has a div with whatever structure. Eventually there is an input. Uh, hopefully it's big enough for you to see, but it doesn't matter an input and a button. And in order to implement the, the clear functionality, which basically, if you think about the logic, the logic means if there is a value here, introduce clear. And when I click on clear, remove the value, right? So that's kind of a simple logic that we implement in JavaScript. And you can see this is a jQuery implementation of this. It does, it basically goes through the HTML to find somewhere where we've, we have this search, CSS classes. Uh, once I found them, go find the form control. So basically, find, look for the DOM, find some attributes to hook into, then look for something else inside, and eventually do hide on something. And this is basically hiding the clear button. And this one here shows the clear button when we have some uh, a key or when we click on something. So if we clicked on something, um, we, we're gonna uh, showing the clear button. Okay, again, we've kind of searched somewhere and apply some function to that if something happens. And at the end, um, we have something to remove the, if I clicked on the clear, uh, again, look to DOM, search the DOM, find it, uh, set its value to zero and put the focus on it and then hide the, the clear button. So it's not a lot of JavaScript. Uh, I mean, this is what, about 10, 15 lines. Looks like a lot hand, of JavaScript to me, Ohad. Uh, well, I'll sh I, I don't think it's, okay. It's not the matter of how many lines of code because I don't mm -hmm. think React code is much shorter. 
Uh, my point in here is basically two important points. First of all, it's a lot of DOM. Uh, so yes. we have to map the logic directly to the CSS classes. And you know, if something changes, the functionality will be broken. That means if tomorrow it's not going to be uh, as clear, it's going to be something else. If bootstrap upgrades or whatever it is, uh, and changing the CSS classes, we all have to change our JavaScript code. Uh, also, the fact that DOM usually DOM manipulations are considered painful uh, in terms of performance, but really that's not so much um, compared to how I, at least in my mind, how I as a typical Rails developer maybe, or but the point for me is really how to envision this logic in my head. When I want to add a new functionality, how do I not break? So, how, first of all, how not to break the current code? Uh, because I just introduced something else that happens at the same time, maybe. So if I create another function that runs on the same kind of selectors, I, I don't necessarily have guarantee for which one is executed first. And even if I do, I have to keep in mind exactly what each one is doing, because we're all kind of going down into the lower level of the browser, finding the values from the HTML or from whatever it is in the DOM, and manipulating it. So adding more logic to this, and we've seen that before. When we add a lot of logic like this, this maybe is fairly simple. But when we add a lot of logic like that, it gets really, really painful. Um, and I don't know how easy also is to automate this through uh, testing, which is another major pain point. So uh, with that in mind, I'm going to jump again and show you, uh, first of all, before I jump, I'm going to show you in my storybook the same uh, search. Uh, here, you can see it has the same uh, HTML representation. I can text some, put the text, uh, you know, enter something, and I can clear it. So basically, the same implementation we just saw, but I'm going to show it in in React. Uh, so again, I'm going to share my my editor. This time, we'll move into the search uh, example. It's a bit longer. I'm going to say it from the beginning, uh, but Bear with me and I'll explain it. OK, so um, again, I'm importing what I want. In this case, I'm importing React. I'm importing helpers, which I'll explain in a minute. And I'm importing all of these uh, bootstrap components, form, form group, control label, form control, and button, uh, all from the React Bootstrap uh, library we saw before. In this example, this is more uh, kind of a class versus uh, if you think about the toast notification, which was just a uh, stateless function, that means you just passed argument and something, you know, we just render HTML. This is a more complete implementation, ES6 style of uh, JavaScript classes. Uh, in here, I have a constructor, which is like an, uh, you know, initializer in Ruby. Uh, I get some uh, properties. Uh, I call super, which basically, if, we, if there is some logic in the parent um, class, and then I can run some code. In this case, I'm setting the initial. Um, so something very important about React Components um, props is the arguments that we're getting. A component is being called or initialized or asked to be drawn. But uh, the state is something that exists through the life cycle of the um, component when the component is basically running. So you could have, and if you think about search, it's very easy to, to explain. The props is I got, for example, an exist. Uh, I, I got no uh, query. That means there was nothing in the input box. And then I start typing. So now I have some value uh, in the input. But um, it's um, basically I'm not changing the argument of how the component, or in this case, the search was called. I'm just having a different value internally within the component to represent its current state. Uh, and what this line basically does, so we have the notion of state within the component, and I'm, I'm setting the initial state effectively. So the value in this case can be set from an existing query. That means I might be able to pass an argument with a query, or I default to a blank. Um, so this just gives me the ability to do something very simple, uh, which is, hold on, uh, which is, uh, two sets of components. One is initial state, there's nothing here. Existing query, 
In this case, I already passed the query to it. So again, how is that going to, how is that used? Let me switch browsers to my editor. So again, in my stories definition, I have the search. In this case, I pass no argument to it. That was the initial state. And I said the other option is that I set the query, and then, then I pass the query. In this case, the query is query, kind of confusing, but uh, I gave it a text. And what happens is that, um, in this case, this current internal state will be uh, either empty or the argument that I uh, passed. Now, one tip about React components is that if you install the React uh, Chrome, and I guess the same happens, exists also for uh, uh, other browsers, basically you get this React tab here. Um, and if you find the component uh, that you have, in this case, it's the search component. Hopefully, it is. I don't know how to make it bigger without. I hope you can you can read uh, the bottom the the browser tools here. But you can see here I've searched, and in this case, it's uh, with query equal query, and you can see here the props and the state. And a good example is that you can now see that the prop state query, but the value changed. And so kind of a easy easy way to you know inspect into the React component, see what's inside. Okay, any questions while I switch screens? Okay. Okay. So going back to my editor. Yeah, there's nothing at the moment. Carry on. Okay. So going back to the editor, um, we have some sort of a helper. I don't know how many of you had to do. Uh, I'm going to ignore it, but just one line about this bind method. Basically, it's an helper that Gail wrote. Uh, every now and then in JavaScript, you have to set the context of the function. If you call a function, uh, you have, if, if you ever saw dot .bind this or something like that, basically sets the context. So this is this kind of line simplifies some logic. I don't want to get into the details, but basically it means that when I type, when I say within a function, I say this dot set state. It actually means the this that I mean, and not some other this. Uh, maybe Gail has a better exam explanation for this function, but that's at least how I interpreted it in my mind. So uh, you can ignore this line for now. So a common structure for Rails component, sorry, for a React component. So it has a constructor, and I'm going to uh, go for all the way down to a render component. Render component is basically what gets rendered on the screen. Um, and in this case, uh, this is very, very similar to the HTML we saw on the Patentfly website. There's a form, form group, control label, form control, you know, all of the bootstrap and Patentfly um, concepts. And you could immediately see which one is a React component, which one is just a standard HTML. In retro, you know, in, in theory, I might have just been using form directly. So I think, again, this would work ju just as well if it was a regular form, HTML form, and not a, um, not a component, React component. But on the other hand, um, it, my personal preference is to have components because later and later, Later on, you have a some place where you can modify behavior without going and searching for all of your code base. So if I ever want to forms, I could do it centrally in one place versus um, you know everywhere I have a form in the HTML. But again, not so important whether it's a nested component or if it's uh, just HTML. But a few things we can we can notice already, uh, and this is I think a nice. Uh, um, Example of, of React. Uh, so I have this is basically the where the input is, um, the and you can see the value. I think that's the, the interesting part. The value of this HTML input, uh, the, in, in, the input we saw earlier, is basically map the state of the uh, of the React component. That means if the state is changing then the value on the screen will be changing as well. They are linked in that regard. That means the browser will take care that whenever I type something, it will be visible. Or if I change the component state, it will automatically be re-rendered. That's one of the PowerPoints of React. If the state changes, 
the re render function is called again, and then it gets displayed correctly with the right value. You don't have to think about when do I render, when do I change, when, how to change, how to propagate change, propagate change. All of this happens automatically. Whenever the properties or the state changes, basically we act smart enough to render the top level component and all of the nested components. And it's very similar if you think about it from as a Rails programmer, it's very similar if you just click refresh on your browser and you now get a new version of your view. So you don't have to think as a JavaScript developer, you don't need really to think about events so much. Like if this change in this jQuery DOM, how would that affect what I have on the screen? What do I have on the screen? And all of that kind of, you know, uh, things like that. You really don't need to think about it anymore. You just need to know that whenever the, the component is changed through state and properties, it will force a re-render and react itself as something called virtual DOM, which is uh, a support to be, su supposed to be fast and I've, so far, all I saw is that it's really fast. Um, so you don't really need to worry that this, you know, take, it puts extra, um, you know, requirements on your browser or anything like that. Okay, so whenever I change the value, uh, the value gets changed also what we see. When we type it in, that's kind of obvious, right? That's what we expect from a browser to do. But when I change it, for, for example, through the uh, clear button, um, then, uh, it's obvious that um, I don't need to do anything, in, in this case, anything uh, sophisticated. So if I, uh, again, look at what this done, so let's look on the on change, first of all. So on change is an event in JavaScript, so whenever something changes, I can call a function, and this function will be executed. So the on change uh, is defined here. And what I do, basically, is prevent, I get an event, I prevent the default, so it's not really required, but it prevent default basically make sure that the browser does not do, do something else that you, you know, you basically tell the browser, I'm owning it, you don't need to do anything by yourself. Uh, for example, think about submit. If you have a form and you have submit, when you click on submit, the, the browser will try to do a, a post, uh, and sometimes you don't, maybe you don't want that to happen, so you can prevent that from happening with this line. Um, then, what we do is we're setting the state. And so whenever there is a change, we basically tell React, hey, change, uh, the state has been changed, and now the state value is the actual value that we got from the, from the, from that individual, uh, in this case, the input. Okay, so nothing exciting here, again. But we're making the, we're basically effectively binding the, the, the value on the screen and the value in the internal, internal representation. In React. Okay, that's easy. Now um, let's 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 keep on going. So we have the the on change. Now let's look at the clear at the, at the clear button. Okay, the clear button again uh, is another function, and uh, I define a variable called content. Again, this is my implementation. There are probably better ways to implement it, but still, um, I define a variable called content, and I'm asking if the current state value is bigger than, it, it's not empty effectively, then put a content. And then I put the button clear, uh, and uh, you know I have also another event handling for when it's actually, when I click on it, what to do with it. But you can see here I've nested kind of uh, HTML, uh, or not HTML, but basically uh, behavior, and, and all, all based on the state. So if the state is empty, nothing gets shown. If the state is now, has some value in it, then I'm automatically showing the clear button. Um, it's very easy to extend this, so I can you know, add more logic, or I can do more logic somewhere else, but on, this, on similar conditions, and I can do, you know, if, if now there's a value, I can do also, for example, a background Ajax call to go and do an autocompleter, for example, or, and it's not related, and I, 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 but I know, you know, I'm, I know the flow, it's all, all happening from similar flow, it's not, individual jQuery matchers or something like that that happens in, uh, without my control. Um, so again, you could see this is a bit longer, and then I have to handle the clear click event. Uh, really doesn't matter so much. I, I don't know if it makes sense to go, uh, but again, the clear click is just setting the value to empty. So I click on clear, basically, again, it sets the state of an empty value. So it's a bit longer uh, implementation. And there's even handling here for submit. 
than what we saw in the initial jQuery. Uh, but this code is testable. This code, I think, is extendable. Uh, and this code can be also be easily reused and controlled in a much easier uh, process. Again, not sure. I'll be honest. I'm not sure if it's the best example. But uh, it's an example a little bit to, to show you a little bit more of React. OK, any questions? All right. Uh, yeah, hang on. Sorry. Um, okay. Take a little a second or two to on, on, my, on mute when you've got so many windows open. Um, so I, I had a question, actually. You mentioned, I don't know if you, stop me if you're going to cover tests separately. Um, is that something I'm planning to talk about in a bit? Or yeah, I, I, I want to, I'll show tests when we. Uh, look. Okay, in that case, I'll reserve my question for the time being. Then. Okay. Um, I also have a question. So you can base or you can uh, create new components by extending existing ones. So I don't know, like inheritance, class inheritance, similarly. Well, I haven't done it myself, um, and I don't know if it's a good or bad practice. Um, I know this is ES6 syntax of creating classes, and they need to inherit. Uh, you know, and in this case, component is a React component representation. So I guess in theory, we can create our own. Uh, you know, if there's a common logic that happens over and over again, you can probably create a, a, a class representation or a parent class. Um, however, in React, I think, and Gail, correct me if you think differently. Um, the idea is to break it down to a lot of small components, and then the component are, can, can be composed in different ways. So you will have one parent component, which calls buttons and calls whatever, and, and another component that again calls button, or if you think of a graph, so whatever component that re represents something, uh, you, you could basically com compose them differently every time in a different use case. Um, but then you're still using the same kind of code paths instead of creating a com common parent class and and having that logic in there and then reusing it. Okay, one of the things that was I think in my email is this idea of separating presentational components and having them not contain logic and and con other types of components which encapsulate more of the logic, uh, but, but emit no markup or very, very little. Um, so that, that's one of the issues. The other is, and this is a general, I think, question in object-oriented programming, um, even non-JavaScript, uh, which is there is um, a thought that perhaps it's better to prefer composition over inheritance. Um, and again, we need to see a specific example um, of, of what, what you mean. Uh, so it, it, so that's, that's part of it. Part of it is that this question of whether or not you would want to do it. Now, with respect to, to the React components, we have two different ways of creating the components. Uh, one is a stateless functional component, and mo the greater part of our components will be those. And since those are not classes, there's no way you could extend it. OK. Um, and then there is like the search here is a class, right? So. Um, the search itself extends components, so you could it could also be um, be extended. In, in fact, that I initially implemented the idea um, that uh, you see in the helpers by extending component and adding the functionality to to um, a class of ours, and then have the the one method, um, and then instead of having things inherit from React component, they would inherit from our common component. But it didn't, I didn't see, uh, I only wanted, it turned out I only had one function there that I needed, so it seemed better to move that into a... Um, okay, you, you mean the helpers here? Yeah. 
Okay. I don't know if you remember that at one point it was a different component. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I reviewed that. Okay. So, um, in, for the interest of time, we have theoretically 10 more or 8 more minutes left. Um, I think there's plenty of topics to discuss. So, what I want to do next is to touch the actual foreman directory structure. So, now that I get, hopefully you've got a glimpse of what React is at high level, we can you know, potentially try to map it to how to read it in Foreman's uh, code base. So I guess, uh, I hope you all know, um, we have a webpack directory under Foreman's uh, root. Um, basically, uh, it has an assets directory inside the JavaScript directory. There's a lot of namespacing, basically, for JavaScript. We could have CSS and other things under there, but um, all, everything basically lives uh, under the JavaScript directory today. The entry point for Webpack in general is the bundle.js. You uh, probably saw that maybe before. Uh, and if you ever wrote, if you recently wrote JavaScript code in Foreman, this is where you would write it in. So you write, we have the Foreman tools and, and all kinds of, you know, traditional uh, um, global spaced uh, kind of uh, JavaScript code that exists here. This is a traditional, maybe semi-traditional code that was converted, or traditional code that was converted to Webpack. So it's ES6 now, you could see. But basically, this is non-React code in here. Um, everything which is React specific uh, is in the React app directory. Uh, you, so you, all of you can probably look at it in your own Git checkout. It's already available for a couple of weeks. Um, and in here, there's two things actually um, worth mentioning. The first thing is React itself. So the components that we kind of discussed about earlier, and you could see here. So for example, the uh, all kind of uh, I, I this is my check. This is my storybook uh, um, uh, PR branch. So it has some things you guys don't have. But for example, the search component that I showed earlier exists here in the common. Uh, components directory, uh, at least in my uh, in, in my Git uh, branch. Um, but besides components, is basically in this common components and com specific components and page specific components, things like that. When we keep on writing this kind of code, but there's a lot of concept that we've introduced, which I I'll be honest, we are in mixed feelings about. But this is the the whole thing that handles data. That means if you have an API call. Um, how do you uh, handle the fetching of the data? Uh, how do you handle the different states uh, in terms of, you know, basically everything which is not purely represent representational. I mean, it's what we see on the screen. But uh, so there's a there's a very a very known JavaScript uh, tool called Flux. Uh, maybe you heard Flux, Redux, other. Uh, basically, what they do is handle the the data. Uh, they introduce concept of stores, and stores contain data, and stores is a concept of a pub sub. That means uh, you register to a store, and whenever a change happens, uh, all of everyone, everyone who subscribed to that store gets a notification, and that's how the UI can now re-render itself through props and states, uh, can re-render the change. So it's very easy to write something that handles this kind of flow, and stores eventually can be used by multiple components, and, and so on. I'm not going to touch any of this in this, just, you know, we don't have the time. Um, uh, sadly, we can definitely do a follow-up deep dive uh, with, with more information about stores. Uh, but just that you know, this is another part of something that we've introduced. Uh, so all the API and dispatcher and actions, all in stores, this is all related to actual, to the data handling of things. And I'm more than happy to discuss them uh, afterwards. Um, what I want to show is basically now specifically to form. And um, so if we go back to the statistics page, remember we have a statistics view, uh, index action on our controller that render an HTML uh, ERB. Uh, this is the index page for the uh, statistics. You can see it's up view statistics slash index HTML ERB obviously get called from the traditional Rails controller. Um, what happens here? It's very simple. Um, 
we kept the title because we had a helper for titles that generates the H1 and all of the tape page header and all of that. And we have a div, which is the, effectively the target div where the statistics code will land in. And after the div is, is uh, created or placed on the DOM, we have a helper called mount react component. In this case, uh, it's mapping basically between the react component, which is called statistics chart list and the statistics div that we've just introduced here. And we've passed some data to it. Now data could be anything. Data uh, is getting usually uh, serialized as JSON and you could pass is the whole attributes that you know all the props for your components and everything you need or it could be a URL to go fetch some other data it could be whatever you think is is you know when you're writing the components but basically uh, if I look at the statistics controller um, we have an index and an index has a metadata object again I don't know if you really care about implementation but basically it gets the metadata out of the charts okay um, so in this case, it just gets the metadata back as JSON. And if, if, we, if we look later in the browser, you'll see that available as a, in the React uh, browser uh, the, the, the tools. Okay, so what the mount React component really does, uh, we have a, something called mounting service. Uh, and in this case, in this version that we have in developed now, it only knows to uh, do the statistic chart list over time, when we add more components or top level components, it, we have to declare them here. Uh, and then we basically map it. So we, when the, it gets mounted, we, this is here how the mapping between the JSX, which trigger and starts all of the components. Um, um, basically, this is what introduced the, generates the statistics the chart list, it passes the data that we define as JSON. This now gets hooked, uh, pushed as, as properties, props to the component. And there is some native JavaScript here that finds the selector, the DOM selector, the div in, the, in our case, and render uh, the markup. If not, you get a you get a console error saying you can't find the div. So, but this, basically this, this helper or this function, the mounting function, maps between the traditional view that we have in, in uh, ERB uh, and allows us to place, uh, even within existing pages, let's say you have a page which is sophisticated, lots of stuff in it, and you now need to introduce something um, new that you think you want to do with React, then this is a great way to inject just a little bit of React code to start with. You don't have to rewrite your page. You don't have to throw it all and start fresh. Basically, you can just target on the things that are painful and, and you know, add the behavior to there. And eventually, if it makes sense, we keep on writing more React code. If not, we keep it as it is. No one asks us, you know, we don't have to replace all of the code and logic just because we want to use some more powerful tooling in this case. Presumably, that also means you don't have to duplicate your snippets. Like, if you want to maintain that, it's easy to, to, to take a piece out and replace it. You don't end up with the old version and the new version in the code base at the same time sure you could you could you know if if the plan is to migrate to react then you can easily swap parts you know slowly and surely instead of uh, uh, just you know have them running in parallel until one is mature enough yeah it's 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 the whole idea the, the things that we really cared for when we wrote this is obviously no one wants to throw away the UI code uh, it's been around forever. It's you know mature. It has mileage. It has, it has its problems, but on the other hand, we know how to handle it. I didn't want to introduce a new host form, for example. Uh, sure. You know, it was, as, just, as, it was just one of the earlier questions was about whether or not we were going to duplicate things, and it feels like you've answered that. So I just wanted to clarify it. Cool. Okay, thank you. Uh, the other thing that we really wanted to care about is plugin developers. Um, you know, this allows us to move forward. So think about your column view, Greg. You have a plugin called Column View. Uh, now, I, I'll, 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 for those who don't know, Column View is a plugin that basically adds another column in the host table. Um, now, I'm, I'm going to be honest and say this is totally our fault that we didn't address these kind of things earlier enough. So plugin has to be created in order to add columns to a table or to be able to you know, add more data to existing tables. 
uh, or hide and show what you care about. Uh, so it's totally our fault that we haven't done this properly. But on the other hand, I didn't want that if I'm going to add enhancements to the host table, which actually has a PR now to show you to show the power status of, of a host uh, in the host table, I didn't want that by introducing a, a new functionality to that table, I'm going to break or necessarily break your column view plugin. Mm -hmm. I wanted to find ways that they coexist until the point, you know, at some point in time, if we replace all of the host tables with React components, then it's going to break. But at that point in time, I'm assuming your plugin will be obsolete, um, for example. We can talk about later on about how to hook plugins and how to enable all kinds of, uh, you know, how new extension points for plugins and so on. But that, that was, in general, plugin as a theme was something we cared a lot about when we developed this. Sure. We didn't want to break anyone's code. We didn't want to, you know, make developers and users unhappy. You know, it was very important to us to find a way that we can slowly but surely uh, introduce new uh, new things about breaking sure. old things. Let's let's move forward because I definitely want to hear about how you use it in plugins. That's a question I've had from a couple of people. So um, I think I think we want to get onto testing and plugins and things like that. Okay. So I'm going to dive a little bit. So basically, I'm just going to follow this path, and I'm going to show you on, on the way a little bit on the you know the statistics implementation. Uh, so. Once the ERB calls this uh, Mount React component, basically it goes down to the statistics chart list, which exists uh, under components. We have a charts and it has a statistics chart list. Um, again, this is the actual implementation for the charts. You can see the concept happening uh, all over again. The components themselves are breaking down. And I can show that in my browser, at least part of it. Um, uh, again, in my storybook, uh, I'm going to show you a few of the different state, states that uh, a chart has. So if I look at the statistics, obviously you all know this state. Uh, we have a title, and there's a spinner. This is the loading state. Uh, we have another state, which is uh, when we don't have a data. Uh, I think it's pretty good. Okay. So when we don't have data, uh, I'm still going to show the, ch the placeholder for the chart, but I'm not going to show any chart. The uh, you know, same if there's an error. I have an indication of an error with some error message. And obviously, the last one is when I actually have the chart, which is the, basically this one. So again, if I refresh this guy here, hopefully I don't have to log in again. You see loading, and obviously now I have the chart. Uh, if I had a failure, I don't know if I'm my local one, I might have a failure on one of those. This is a, a development environment, so by definition, slower. Um, also, I think the fact that I'm sharing my screen makes it a bit slower. But um, generally, what happens behind the scene is that each chart makes an API call. Um, and if we if we look in the in what happens, I'm not going to dive into the code, but just to show you a little bit about the, the, the React part of it, uh, just that you get the, the, the structure. We have a statistics chart list, which basically gets uh, the, the, the metadata that we saw earlier. The metadata is just, you can see here an example, uh, the charts themselves, the definitions of the charts. In this case, things like title, uh, search is if you click on it, where to go and search for it. Uh, URL is where to find the chart. The, you know, the, later on there's an API call to get the data itself. So where the where the data, where, which URL to hit for in order to get the data. Um, and if we if we go deeper, you see the statistic chart list actually have a statistics chart. So look at the architecture one, for example. Uh, so again, so we have a no notion of something called a chart box, which is the whole, you know, header and the chart and all of it, all, everything inside here. And this is consists of a panel, again, bootstrap kind of pattern fly panels, um, which is a component by itself. Again, common component. And, you know, this breaks down again, panel heading, panel body. Um, and then there is a notion of coming something called a loader. So all of the spinner and all of that, basically, it's a common logic where we have a state, and when the state is, you know, not ready yet, 
it will show you the spinner. When it's ready, it will show you the, some other con the actual content. When there's an error, it will show you an error content. But basically, you know, this again encapsulates the chart itself. And you know, at the end of the day, this is where the chart logic exists. But you can see how components are intercomposed all the way, uh, you know, from top to, to bottom. Uh, and this will map uh, exactly to the code if you look uh, into, uh, again, I think, back to, to our to my editor. And you can see here all of these components. So the chart, we started in the chart list, then we have the chart box. And inside the chart, we have the panel, which is common. You can reuse it in other cases. And, you know, panel and, and the loader, sorry. And loader handles the spinners and so on and so forth. And at the end, you have the chart one which basically does the, the drawing of the chart and integrates the library called C3. Um, so uh, the statistics one is not a natural, not an easy one because there's lots of files and lots of things, but I'm going to show you a little bit of, you know, of testing. Uh, one thing which is different uh, from Rails testing is that the testing files are located right next to the uh, uh, code, so they actually live in the same directory. You could see the, st the statistic chart box and the statistic chart box test. Um, this is easy also, you know, we have them, in, you develop them in parallel and they actually, um, because it goes through Webpack compilation, they're not included in the source code of the, you know, bundle JS that eventually gets to the browser. Um, there's a few things to keep in mind here. You know, we have, we use something called Jest uh, as a library. Uh, or the test um, framework, uh, and we have uh, a tool called Enzyme, which basically allows us to mount the React component and test it. Um, I won't go in details exactly, but here is an example. Uh, we're testing that it's uh, a pending state, and I'm going to mount the statistic chart work component with all of these arguments, and I'm going to find that there's a spinner in there. I could write different tests, but this is this, this test just checked as a spinner. Uh, same for error, that has an error icon, and so on and so forth. So you can write tests, uh, much more meaningful tests um, than we ever had before. Uh, that's, um, that's proper unit tests, right? Rather than the yeah, driving right. the UI then, style tests that we used to do. Yeah, and, and it's very important. These tests are really, really fast. They are not integration tests in Jenkins that it takes forever to run. Uh, you you can run them, you know, besides setting up your editor to to use the linting and all of that stuff in real, which is really awesome. You, you, for example, I use Atom, and Atom with VI binding and linting makes it really, really comfortable environment to develop. But also the testing itself, if you run, uh, if you run on your, on your uh, form and checkout, you just run NPM test, you'll see that they're really fast, um, unlike our Ruby unit tests. Uh, obviously, this is because there's not so many tests, but still, um, then you don't have to write sophisticated integration tests for UI testing if you do this. Um, I'm for, for interest of time, I'm kind of afraid to open more stuff. Uh, so I want to... Sure. Uh, I, think, I think that's probably the only question that's worth asking is, is there, is there an example for using this in a plugin, I think, is the only outstanding question I have. Okay. So also, we don't need to go too far into it, but just if there's examples out there, can we maybe point to so, those? So I think it's very, so it breaks down into two. If there is a React component already in core, which I hope over time will have plenty of components in core, whether it's for tables or forms or you know other things, or just icons and statuses and whatever it is, then you just use it like this, like this line. You mount your React component, you give it some arguments, and you're done. You got it for free. Okay. Now, if you don't, if you want to develop new React components for your plugin, then it's a bit of a different uh, story, because effectively what you need is to introduce Webpack to your plugin. Uh, yeah. Once you have Webpack as part of your plugin, uh, and then then it's very easy. Um, but we haven't. We decided as a as a as a as a yeah, we decided to focus first on core because core is where we have most of the issues with UI. Obviously, plugins uh, also have issues with UI, but core needs, you know, we, we decided to handle core first. 
Um, the part of the reason is why we haven't addressed plugins because it's a bit more complicated to develop core and plugin JavaScript at the same time. Mm -hmm. It's not overly complex, but uh, just that you guys know, the way it works basically, we have Webpack. There's a notion of Webpack developer server, which is um, basically introducing live reload. So whenever you change the code, the browser automatically loads reload that part, and you, you know you get a very positive um, development of uh, or process. So even if in the storybook, if I change the code here in my editor and I go back to the browser, it's already updated. Um, now, this actually happens for a separate port and where Webpack is running and there's a WebSocket and all that kind of stuff happening in behind the scene. And you know, if we introduce this also for plugins, we have to create a new port and then the secure headers and you know, all kinds of small details that needs to be sorted. So whenever there's a plugin who is eager to start using this, I'm more than happy to support the plugin offer, and we'll get it done. Uh, it hasn't been done yet. That's that's all. So so the summary is: if if you're wanting to use some components that don't exist in Core yet, consider opening a PR to Core. <laughs> well, I think I think it's great because at the moment there's not too many people who know this stuff yet. My hope is that we extend this and people are encouraged by this. Uh, Deep dive and the mail that Gail sent earlier this week with all the links and you know people are would be interested in learning more about how to use React. Uh, so I think there's no um, you know once we have a, get to a, a minimal critical mass, then uh, I'm pretty sure this will happen naturally. Uh, I was I I was pref I prefer to focus on core at the, for, at the moment so we have a sufficient enough of examples. Uh, and then you know we'll focus on plugins as that well. That makes sense, and, and I think it's likely that the common things that plugins will want are going to be shared between plugins, and therefore make sense to be yeah. available in core anyway. So I, yeah, I think for for simple stuff, if it's not a specific UI to something very specific you're doing in your plugin, it's probably easier to open a PR to core and get that component added for everybody. Right. right. So my, my my hope is, for example, if you want a chart now, it's very trivial. You'll use the statistic chart box. And pass a URL where you bring back the value of data, and and, and you're done, right? So right. It, it's right. similar experience to using your you know helpers we had before. Indeed. So, is there anything else you want to go into, or are we? Uh, the time. If you guys manage to stay focused all this all until this now, I mean, I'm, I'm I'll just take the opportunity to thank you. Um, I think this is probably a series, or beginning of a series, maybe of more deep dives around these issues. Um, so I'll be happy to hear feedback about what didn't we cover, wasn't what wasn't clear, how can we improve, uh, so we know you know what to, what you guys want to hear. Um, and and that's it. Okay. Well, um, I don't see any outstanding questions on the channels. If anybody on the the broadcast has anything to say, now is a good time. Oh, thanks a lot. I thought it was um, great. Well, it's clear to me without it. <laughs> I understood anything. Yeah, well done, Gail. Yes, I'm sure it is. All right. Well, in that case, I think we will start to wrap things up. So thank you very much, everyone, for watching. We have overrun slightly, but I think it was valuable and worth doing. Uh, to those who've watched the whole broadcast, well done. Uh, if you're watching live, if you're watching later, do follow our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter. You'll get notifications of what's going on at all times. Thanks both to Ohad and Gail uh, for the presentation, and do take care. Thanks, Greg. <laughs>